So good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you as we close out Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, I just want to make a note, this is not the only time we should be celebrating Hispanic Heritage. It's during this month, we should do it all year. Um, but it's, it's really a great opportunity to use this time to host an event um, and talk about the issues that are important to the uh, community moving forward as New York continues to grow. So my name is Melva Miller, and I'm the CEO of the Association for a Better New York. Um, I'm really happy to be in this space. I am actually a student of uh, the Graduate Center, and we actually have the president of the CUNY Graduate Center and the provost in the back. Um, and my job is really simple here today. I am here to just introduce the person who will kick off and lead this event, our Abney Foundation trustee, Tonio Burgos, who is an amazing, amazing leader in New York City, across the board, although he might live across the river, it's okay. Um, but he is uh, a, one of the founders of the Association for a Better New York. He's been there since the beginning, and he is still not only running the city, but he's running Abney. So with that, I'd like to uh, invite Tonio Burgers to come and address you. Thank you. Buenos días. Esperemos que todo el mundo está listo para una discusión de primera clase, porque tenemos un panel aquí de líderes bien importantes de nuestra ciudad que entienden que el momento es ahora. Y tenemos unos presentadores que van a hablar pronto también que entienden que nuestro momento ha llegado. Y esta organización APNI, que yo he sido un miembro de la organización desde el 1975, este, Roberto sabe que yo soy viejo, porque yo conocí al padre de él. Pero esta organización siempre ha cogido posiciones bien clave, en momentos bien clave en la historia de Nueva York. Y este momento que nos encontramos ahora es un momento tan importante, la representación de latinos, hispanos, en esta ciudad, en este estado, en esta nación. Y, y por ahí, hoy tenemos un ejemplo de liderato que ha salido para adelante y ha empujado para adelante. Pero Abney ahora ha cogido este interés y estamos bien apreciando mucho lo que Abney ha hecho. Un aplauso para Abney. For those of you who suffer in translation, <laughs> let me say welcome to the Graduate Center at CUNY. CUNY has been a trailblazer for decades. Uh, and CUNY in 1975 uh, was part of what was happening around Abney's growth and leadership. Uh, the battle to save CUNY when the city of New York was near bankruptcy, the state of New York was near bankruptcy, and, and CUNY uh, was a very important pivotal point to ensure that the city of New York student population had a college to go to. We were free tuition before the fiscal crisis, and we've worked, CUNY has worked hard to get to the point where all kinds of programs are available. And, and that's frankly because of Abney being a leader in a critical time, and Abney is a leader today. Abney is convening us here to talk about a very important issue about representation of Latinos, Hispanics, across the board, not only government, but private uh, sector, civic, as well as other organizations. New York City is the greatest city in the world, by far. And it is the melting pot of a great, great migration and immigration of people from all over the world. My family migrated here from a little island 100 miles long, 35 miles wide, known as Puerto Rico. And we moved to a little neighborhood, which we had to share with Italian Americans and make it work, called Spanish Harlem. We never called it East Harlem, Robert, right? <laughs> and, and, and we worked our way up, and people like Robert's father, who became a councilman, the first Puerto Rican councilman in that district, and, and the representation began to grow. And 
when you hear today from Felix Matos, Felix Matos is a very important fact, and that's just because he's the big shot chancellor of CUNY, but because he did something very important. He kept Centro going. What is Centro? 50 years of the study of Puerto Rican political, cultural, and civic engagement in this city. And he did that before he was chancellor. He was working at Hunter College, running Centro, and made it what it is today, and now helped bring it to Spanish Harlem on 117th Street. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Abney. Welcome to this great panel. It's a timely discussion. And for somebody who knows a little bit about representation, I served for two years as the appointment secretary to Governor Mario Cuomo, and we worked very hard to create that kind of a representation. And I believe every government tries very hard, but it's a two-way street. Let me leave you with this thought. One of the hardest things I found bringing people to Albany was getting people to Albany. <laughs> and believe me, you know, there's a great movie called Northwest Passage with Spencer Tracy and Robert Young, and they run out to the Hudson and they get on a canoe and they say, we're going to Albany to see the governor. So I'm not recommending that you get in canoes, but certainly think about Albany as a place of public service as New York City is a public service area. So now I give you my great friend, that great leader of the CUNY system. He has an extraordinary history, as I said, Hunter College. Then he went to Puerto Rico and he became cabinet secretary of human services, came back became the president of Ostos, Ostos, which was the linchpin of CUNY's diversity, beginning of diversity in the system, and then went on to Queens College, and now he's our great chancellor, Felix Matos Rodriguez. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Tonio, and uh, how about a big shout out for, let's talk about a trailblazer, in, in the Latino community here in New York and, and in all things political and all things good, uh, Tony always has uh, a hand in there to be, to be supportive. And uh, when, I, when I came uh, as a faculty member who was, had the, the great blessing of directing the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, one of the people that let me uh, advise, support, guidance, uh, Tony, so thank you so much. Mi amigo del alma, another shout out for, for Tony. Let me, uh, you know, thank uh, President Garrell and Provost Everett for being with us. Great leadership here at the Graduate Center. So, and, uh, um, you know, Melba had to say hi to you guys because she's a graduate student here. I don't have to, so mine is just pure, <laughs> mine is just pure, pure gratitude. But great to be here uh, with you this morning, and thank you to Abney. I'm a proud uh, board member. I have now been in the... I have not been in the board since 1975, so I have some catching up to do to be able to get the frequent uh, flyer miles that Tonio has with Abney, but um, I'm delighted. There's so much synergy in what Abney tries to do and what the City University tries to do that is a natural, and then when you have Stephen and Melba at the helm, you know that you're in good hands. Great to also be part of this warm-up uh, with our Secretary of State. Uh, I feel that I am El Jamón del Sandwich between two legends, you know, Tony and Robert, so great to have our Secretary of State with us here, so welcome, welcome, welcome. And a wonderful panel with, with great friends and great leaders. I'll just say a few things. Um, before I became Chancellor, when I came to Hunter, I was just a historian. I taught history, uh, proud to teach Caribbean and Latino history, so if I were in a place like this, I would be like your nerdy talking head. I'll be the person sort of you know, giving statistics and history and making remarks and, 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 that, and that kind of work. Um, so I'll say, I'll say two things. A, um, incredibly proud of the work that the City University of New York has done with the Latino community. Uh, the growth in the last decade of our Latino student body has been 21%. 31% of the students system-wide are Latinos, so the largest ethnic group of students in the system right now is Latino, which shouldn't be surprising if you look at the demographics of, uh, of our city. And so our campuses here, uh, obviously that number is far higher, right? You think about 
hostels and Bronx community, 64, 65% of the students are Hispanic, Lehman, uh, Gutman, which is very small, John Jay, uh, all of those are um, Hispanic serving institution, which is a designation the federal government gives to any school that has over 15% of more other students being Latino, right? And almost all of the Hispanic serving institutions in New York State are CUNY schools. And I'm very proud of that, right? Uh, because it's a designation that shows that students are voting with their feet, right? It's an added batch of responsibility about what we need to do to make sure that those students keep attending, they attend, and that they graduate, and they go into fulfilling lives and careers, right? So it's, it's also a designation which is on us to do more work, to keep those doors open of opportunity, and to make sure that those students thrive and succeed. So we take that very seriously. But since I have elected officials in the House too, those you can apply to pots of money that are not open to other schools. So that designation actually allows us to bring money to the state of New York in terms of grants that wouldn't otherwise be there. So that Hispanic serving designation actually is an economic development uh, tool for the state because if that was not there, there's a large number of grants that many of our campuses get that we wouldn't be able to apply for. Um, there's a great song, and it's a song that I tried to, uh, and I would not do that to you guys, I would not, I would not sing, right? But it's, it's a song that I uh, either sing or tararear. Tararear is um, mumble, hum, whatever, uh, um, when I get up in the morning, right? And it's Celia Cruz's song, La Dicha Mía. I don't know if you heard it. Uh, lo primero que yo hago al despertar es dar gracias a Dios todos los días, right? And then Celia goes and she tells her musical story about all the great fortune she had to play with amazing musicians and how blessed she's been to have that, that great career. And I think about that when I think about the blessing that I have to serve as a chancellor of the State University of New York because, I mean, there are days in which I sing that in the morning feeling less dichoso right, feeling less blessed, I mean, there, there are those days. Um, but uh, it's an incredible privilege, but it is a privilege that in part is connected to the struggles and the victories of the Latino community to be able to identify space, in this case, in higher ed, right, and the investments that higher ed had made in this space that allowed me to serve as the first Latino chancellor of the system. And I'm very, very conscious of that, and I have it with me every day. I came, I mean, I probably wouldn't have been attracted to come as a faculty member to Hunter or to CUNY if it didn't have the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, right? Which is the first, and now we have the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, Center for Dominican Studies, Center for Mexican Studies, right? There's other centers too, but in the Latino space, uh, and then the only two, the Puerto Rican and the Dominican in the entire country, dedicated to those groups, right? But we also know that those were investments that were not made initially because CUNY was totally happy to have these spaces. It required struggle, it required advocacy, right? And then they became mainstream and embraced and really part of the institution. But you know, I, I, I'm not gonna sugarcoat the history because I'm chancellor, right? That didn't happen just because somebody got around and said, oh yes, yes, we're gonna include, the, we're gonna fund this thing, right? It, it was a lot of elected officials, community leaders coming and saying, this space is necessary, we need it in the city, and we're gonna make the investment. And I'm proud that CUNY listened and has continued to invest and to nurture that space and to use that model for growth over the years, right? So that's the first linkage in my career, in my trajectory, uh, that is associated with investments. The second one is, I returned back uh, from being part of the contact sports of Puerto Rican politics, serving as, <laughs> as you know, uh, one of the happy jobs, Commissioner of Social Services, right? Because that's, that's a high-ho, high-ho job that everybody wants to, uh, to, to have, right? And, um, and I had the blessing to be the president of Osos Community College. And how did Osos Community College came about? 
It wasn't that there was a, a report that CUNY had that said, hmm, you know what? It's really time to invest in the South Bronx because there's a lot of, you know, Puerto Ricans and other Latinos there and we're gonna create a school there. You guys know that that's not the history, right? The community said, if we say that higher ed is the way to the future, right? How come there's no higher ed space in a community that has some of the most difficult and challenging socioeconomic indicators, right? And folks took over a building and said, hasta que no tengamos un colegio, we're not gonna go, right? And, oh, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna grant it, right? And then the next year, oh, no money in the budget, what's gonna go? We're gonna cut that, right? And people go, no, 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 you're not gonna cut us. And then they will go back and they protest some more. Uh, they will take their desk and put them in the grand concourse when the Yankees were playing home to mess up traffic even more, right? To show that that space mattered, right? And they did that time and time and time again, right? Uh, until now, uh, there's a provision in the law in Albany, right, that, that actually, of all the 25 campuses, the only one that requires a vote of the Assembly and the Senate to be closed is Hostos, right? Y eso fue por lo mucho que fastidiaron the people in the community fighting for that space. And actually, the second building to grow Hostos, it was not the traditional route now in which you have the assembly member lobbying and saying, can we get capital dollars and how can we do this for the next building? They wouldn't give them additional space, so they took over another building. And I said, this is, and that's how the campus grew, right? So I become president of another space that I'm very clear that was created and existed as a result and actually is an example of what Latinos have contributed because that contribution now serves students that come from all parts of the world and in that borough. So I'm very conscious that I have the opportunity and the blessing to serve in this capacity because of the struggles, the fights, the advocacy, la lucha of people that came before me and created those space. And luckily, leadership at CUNY every time that embraced them and saw them as assets to be continued, right? So I carry that legacy with me. I carry that legacy and that commitment with me. Uh, and again, there's no better, way to, no better way to think about that, to have Celia Cruz on your back with a beautiful song reminding you of, of the blessings that we have, but also the commitments that we have to pass it on to the next generation and to take the advantage of space like this to see where we are in the present and then what are the tools and the things that we need to do so that the future is better for even more generations of Latinos and all New Yorkers to come. Which allows me to do a perfect segue, right? Who could be better about thinking about the future of the Latino community and how we can contribute and how that can be a space that benefits Latinos and everybody in our state than our Secretary of State, <laughs> right? Who we know as someone that had a brilliant uh, political uh, trajectory serving the community in, in El Barrio, in East Harlem, uh, distinguished record of accomplishment in, in the assembly, and, uh, and now the governor had the good uh, foresight to uh, make him his, uh, her uh, Robin in the, in the Batman and Robin team in terms of the things that are important to the state. And, uh, and I have enjoyed seeing him on Facebook in, in La Feria in Canada and all those upstate places that they send the Secretary of State, <laughs> right, uh, to do things. So why don't we give a big warm up to someone who cares about CUNY, cares about Latinos, cares about New York, our Secretary of State, Robert. <laughs> Buenos dias. Good morning. The good thing about going after a fellow and Antonio is I can build on all their jokes. <laughs> and there are many, but um, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be here with you on behalf of Governor Hochul and to celebrate Hispanic heritage. Um, and of course, we'll do the greetings. I wanted to say, of course, thank you to the Abney Chair, Stephen Rubenstein, and of course, Melva Miller, who we all know to be a rock star, and of course, Chancellor Felix Matos Rodriguez, and recognizing the work that Abney, Abney does. And I think it's um, an interesting thread that there happen to be two 50th anniversaries, Abney and Centro, at the same time, which is, I think, completely apropos to the dynamic that was happening at that time, and just that 
force, that, that thread, that not only does the city of New York have to survive, but there also needs to be a place and a recognition for the diversity that was happening um, in, the, in the city at that time. So I think it's great to recognize both of those things in this place and in this space. And of course, with the chancellor, it is so important. We're gonna be talking about representation. And to have that representation as the first Latino chancellor for CUNY is so heartwarming. It makes us as Latinos so proud to have um, that, begun that legacy and that tradition, that barrier having been broken. Because as we're, we're gonna talk about um, a little bit later, so much of that is being able to see the possible, to see where we can be. Um, and I think um, in so many ways, that's why representation matters. Porque cuando hice esa, esa llamada, diciéndole que mira, siempre tiene que cuidar a, al centro, it wasn't a hard push. It was, it, was, it was easy. It was like, great. I don't ever have to talk about that again with him. Estamos, estamos bien. And that's what it means. We don't have to always fight the same battles. It gives us the opportunity to take on new battles and challenges. So as you might have ascertained, I'm a proud Boricua from East Harlem, El Barrio. We don't really like the East Harlem thing. We like to say El Barrio and everybody just knows, you know, like one word places, one name people, it's all good. Um, but it's really, really great. And what's important about what I get to do as Secretary of State and of course representing the, gover the governor is just really pronounce the, the efforts that we have to make sure that this administration looks like us, this administration represents Latinos, that, this, that we have Latinos in leadership. And that's uh, an ongoing thing I like to remind people, we're only a year old, we're gonna get there. Um, but that work happens hand in hand with Julissa Gutierrez, our Chief Diversity Officer who is here. That is one of her missions in life. <laughs> but also a passion, so I wanna recognize her and just go back to this theme about representation and why it matters. And part of the, the data that I'm gonna, I'm gonna cite comes from the work of ABNY and the tremendous efforts they did around census, um, you know, this, this past go around, and also um, uh, some of the demographic crunching that came from Hector Gortero Guzman and the, and the, um, uh, the institute at, at, the research institute at CUNY is that Latinos are the most rapidly growing community in America, and certainly here in, in New York State. We represent nearly 30% of New York City's population and 19% statewide. So we are the second largest demographic group in the state, and why does this matter? I think it translates into economic vibrancy and vitality. So in 2019, the numbers say that we have 4.5 million businesses with Latino ownership. And we're the fastest segment of the population in America. So we're gonna double that. I think that's almost a certainty. But that means that we are also dealing with um, the ability to educate, provide economic opportunity, take on a responsibility to, as a result, move social justice, and also multiply the spending power of the Latinos across the state and with that influence the greater and broader society. So there's a lot around what we can do, uh, and I'm sure we're gonna talk about that with respect to representation. Our first step was elected representation. Next step is higher education, ongoing conversations are boardrooms and CEOs. Representation matters. Um, so with that, one of the things that I like to say and, and remind people about the Department of State is we're your first point of entry if you are starting a new business or if you are a nonprofit. So we touch you all at one point. And to think about those 4.5 million people, businesses that, that are potentially gonna get started across the nation and what percentage of those are here in New York State and our ability to support them as a government in helping them to achieve those efforts is the role that um, we look to grow at the Department of State. And I think the, Dr. Uh, Guzman, because I've been to a few hostos things uh, this week and he was a, a wonderful honoree, reminded us that we like to say that Latinos are resilient. And we are. But that generally happens because we make do with less. 
Imagine if you gave us the resources. Resiliency plus resources is a good investment. So that's part of the message that I think we have to remind people as we take our place in um, you know, New York and New York State society, but also society generally. And that is, I think, um, you know, where our strength lies. So it's a real honor and pleasure to be here with you. I appreciate the opportunity. You're going to hear from wonderful panelists who I've served with, who I love dearly, and who continue to fight those fights on the social justice and political realm. And I thank all the leaders at ABNY for helping us break through many of those boardrooms um, that we know that we can add value to and improve the products and the services that they're providing across the city and state of New York as well as the country. So thank you and uh, celebraciones. Good morning, everybody. Um, first, I want to thank Abby for not making this an 8 a.m. event. <laughs> <laughs> There's no tweet notes. That, no, not tweet notes. Teresa Gonzalez, um, I know many of you, but I'll introduce myself. I am a partner at Bogus City Guns. I also run a small firm called David Gonzalez, one of the only Latina owned firms in the city. Um, states. Uh, I'm really excited to be here for a number of reasons, but before we get started, I would be remiss if I didn't say that following all these incredible, incredible men who have been innovators and pioneers, let's not forget the Latino ones. <laughs> um, so I, I kind of feel like this is a special privilege for me to be the first Latino to speak. There was a moment where I was like, can I really follow them? And I was like, wait a minute, I'm Teresa Gonzalez, of course. <laughs> member. Uh, uh, he worked as a tenant lawyer and successfully defended Bronx residents in eviction and landlord harassment cases. Very important, he's the chair of the Twin Park Citywide Task Force on Fire Prevention and the co-chair of the Black Latino and Asian Caucus. Thank you for being here. Leslie Ramos, Executive Director of the 82nd Street Bid, which includes Jackson Heights and Elmhurst and Queens. There are a lot of Queens in the house today. Yes, right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, calm down. Where's Brooklyn now? <laughs> okay, I guess it's just me. Um, Leslie Ramos joined the 82nd Street Partnership in October 2014 as Executive Director. She has extensive experience working with small businesses, city agencies, and the Latino community. She brings a wealth of knowledge in economic and community development practices. She began her career in city government, is a member of the Latina Leadership Forum's founding committee, and a former board member of Latina PAC. She also teaches at Brooklyn College. I, used, I did, I did before. She also before. taught at Brooklyn College, Puerto Rican and Latino Studies Department, so thank you for coming. Welcome. So, um, it would be easy for me to dwell on my disappointments, and anybody who knows me knows that I oftentimes waste my disappointments about where I think Latino leadership should be and where representation should be. That would be easy for me to do. I'm not gonna do that. What I wanna talk about is opportunity. Um, and I think these folks embody what it means to work hard, but what it means to keep your community front and top of mind. Um, so first question is going to be, I'll start with you, that's okay. 
What do you think is the biggest challenge facing Latinos in New York? <laughs> not, a, not a hard question. We had this conversation a few months ago. Uh, so, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Uh, okay. How about this? Is this good? All right. So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Melva, for the invitation. I really appreciate being here. Um, I, I do have to give a shout out to uh, Fellow because I am a double CUNY grad and I always, and I, I always got to give love to CUNY because uh, for me, CUNY, I, and I have said this and you've heard me say this, CUNY saved my life. Literally, I don't know if I would be here, um, uh, actually here, if CUNY hadn't given me the opportunity to succeed in the way that it has. So anytime I get to give them an absolute thank you, I do because I think they are a fantastic education system and they are the way up and out for many of our kids. It was for me, so. Um, so, look, if you, it, it depends on where, where, when what we're talking about when we talk about uh, the state of, of Latinos. You could be talking about politics, we could be talking about what's happening with small businesses. So, given that you're asking me the question, I'm going to focus on the political piece. Somos muy odiosos sometimes. You know, we are at a place in Latino politics where uh, some people think there's not enough stage for all of us to get on top of, of the stage and all of us to shine. And, and I'm actually going to use your mentor as an example, uh, as a good example. Uh, Adriano has found a way to open the door for a lot of people and to bring everyone on stage and to say, we're all going to succeed. And your commitment has to be that we're all got to support each other. And so I think when you find uh, those opportunities to say, let's all march together, let's all make sure that we're highlighting what the other is doing, and we as Latinas have created these little groups, uh, and, and many of them are here right now, where we show up to events and we support each other and we got each other's backs, but that's not always the case because when you start thinking about que si es el colombiano, que si es el puertorriqueño, que si es el dominicano, and there's times when you start getting into, excuse my French, and I see the camera, these bullshit political fights that are more about who gets to shine and less about how do we all do it together. The stage is gigantic. We can all get up on that stage, shine, support each other, because at the end of the day, we may be the face of a particular district, but when we are not shining, when we're not supporting each other, you know who suffers? Our community. Because at the end of the day, you and I still get our check. We can go home, we're still elected. But if we are not supporting each other in the way, work that we do, it is our community that's going to suffer. And so for me, you know, a direction that I'd like to see people go in is a little bit less ego would be really nice, but it's politics, so you know, it's a little bit difficult, but a little bit less ego and a lot more uh, pueblo. Good morning, everyone. Saludos. Such an honor and a privilege to be here with all of you uh, celebrating Hispanic heritage. I am New York City Council Member Oswald Feliz, proudly representing the BX Bronx. And I want to start by thanking ABNY for organizing this panel. I want to thank my colleagues in government uh, for joining. I want to thank all of you as well for being a part of it. And I got to say, I'm really proud to be back here in CUNY. Uh, my higher education journey started at Bronx Community College in the Bronx and then Lehman College in the Bronx, and then CUNY School of Law, so. Yeah, yeah, I heard it. So triple, triple CUNY graduate. <laughs> and you know, today we celebrate so much. We celebrate the history, the culture of the Hispanic community. We also celebrate the progress that we have made, and progress that was only achieved through hard work of previous generations, as our uh, chancellor mentioned. And that takes me to my story. My father and my mother came from the Dominican Republic about 40 years ago. My father uh, started as a cab driver, a black licking town car, and my mom started as a home attendant. And they worked very hard so that I and my uh, siblings could become lawyers, college professors, and also sitting, sitting council member in the city of New York. And <laughs> the Hispanic and the Latino community faced this is a lot of issues, um, and I'll talk about three of them. All three are related. I think one of them is the lack of opportunity that we have in Hispanic communities, but especially in the neediest, most 
the, the poorest Hispanic communities. They, all these communities have one thing in common, and that is that they lack the opportunity that they deserve. And a similar second point is um, the racial segregation that exists in so many aspects of our life, um, in our housing, in our schools, and I think that is also contributing to the lack of opportunity. And the third thing, very related to the first and second point, is the lack of representation. The lack of representation. Uh, last month, we actually had a hearing with the fire department in the city of New York. The city of New York, New York is the most diverse city in the country, and how is it that in a city as diverse as this one, only 13% of firefighters are Hispanic? Only 13% of firefighters are Hispanic. So that is a challenge that we have, making sure that our agencies and that every aspect our, of our life and every area and every field um, is as diverse as we can be. Uh, the Hispanic community gives back to our city and our country every single day, and there's only one way of showing that love back, and it is by diversifying and giving us spaces in every table. Buenos dias. Um, thank you. Um, first of all, Melva, thank you for inviting me and make me part of this amazing panel and our guests. Um, I did not realize that it was going to be an overtake of Puerto Ricans. Um, I'm a proud Boricua, um, born in Brooklyn, but raised in Cantera. Um, I think some of you guys know what that means. And uh, if you know Cantera, you would understand why I'm in economic development. Um, come from a community that we are been in the process of economic development before I was born. Uh, my community was born um, invadiendo tierras, which means basically people when were displaced from the farms, they end up in San Juan where there was no housing. And some of the people said, we're just going to you know, put our ground here. Um, so this is sort of what had inspired me to do economic development. Um, like many Puerto Ricans, we had to move around uh, based on economics, and I ended up back in New York. I, made a, I went to, from Puerto Rico to Chicago, went to Syracuse, and ended up here. And I'm very um, honored to actually be working with a mostly immigrant community. And many people say, why are you Puerto Rican? You don't understand it. I think like some of the examples that were mentioned earlier, I'm very aware of the struggles that Puerto Ricans had when they arrived here. Here. Um, and we arrived very early, early on. We know people that in the 20s that were born here. Um, and my parents, uh, they did not speak English. Um, they only had first grade education. And they were treated as foreigners all the time. And doors were um, close to them many often. I'm the Blanquita of the family. So I know that um, I have the privilege of being white passing until I open my mouth. Um, and then the attitudes change, and I see that all the time. And I think going back to uh, one of the challenges that uh, minorities face, I think it is that, it's representation, uh, because it really, really matters. There's often um, in the field that I'm in, in economic development and small businesses, um, there's not many of us. So I often, even though I'm very confident of my English, I know I'm speaking a foreign language to many of the people in the room, um, which if you look in New York City, you look at the city agencies, look at Economic Development Corporation, most of the people don't look like us, whether it is racially or economically. There, I worked under the Bloomberg administration, I actually started, I'm ashamed, but um, before he was mayor, but I was often the only person in the room that was a minority and the only came, one who came from a poor background. So until we start changing that, we are still going to be struggling. So representation really matters because when we're talking about economic recovery, we are having people doing policy based on theory with very little understanding how that theories translate to reality. So I would have to continue to say, in this case, um, representation. Thank you. Can you hear me without this? Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Fine. Um, OK. Uh, so let's talk about representation, right? Clearly, that is a common thread here. I talk about it all the time. We need to be better represented in all levels, not just politics, but in every space. We're 29% of the population, all of the statistics, right? And we continue to kind of push that narrative. But I guess my question is, are we headed in a better direction? And if so, 
right? Or, or is it getting better? And if so, how much of that is, and I'm gonna use the term our to, to mean us and our community. How much of that is our responsibility? I mean, if we, if we start looking at where we were politically, say, 10 years ago, or even five years ago, I think we have um, a lot, uh, we have come a, lot, a, a long way uh, from a numbers uh, point, from if we're looking at simply the numbers, how many more Latinos did we have in office five years ago, or even 10 years ago than we have now? Um, it hasn't, it, it's coming at a high expense to many of us because running for office uh, when you're a Latino is, is extremely difficult, even in the Latino community, because we don't come from backgrounds. Um, and for the folks in here who are not familiar with how expensive it is to run for office, it is really expensive. And the majority of us come from working class families where you can't afford to take nine months off from work uh, unpaid and just, oh, se paga la renta solita, we'll figure it out. It doesn't work like that. And so when you look at, uh, um, at where we are from a numbers point, yes, we've come a long way, but we are nowhere near uh, a place where we can say, our electorate it, it is representative of our citizenry, if you will, or, or the folks who are in our community. Um, because we also have one more piece of this puzzle that is, diff that is different. We have a lot of Latinos who are permanent residents. We have a lot of Latinos who are refugees, who are undocumented, and they can't vote. So we have layers upon layers of what does representation really look like um, in, in many communities. I happen to represent a community where 60% of the people are born in another country and 40% can cannot vote. And so almost half of the people that I represent can't vote. So I can't really say that the three or four electeds that represent that community um, were, were elected by the majority. That's not, that's not a thing because, again, the numbers are just not there. But if we start to think about how, how did we actually change that? You know, there are, um, and, and sorry dudes, but there are women uh, who, who have come before us, who I think have made gigantic strides um, at their own expense of their own happiness, of their own ability to uh, uh, live uh, the kind of lives that everybody else gets to live. They don't get to go on, on the vacations. They don't get to go on the family uh, uh, Christmas trips because this is a job that takes a lot of time. And so I'm referring to folks like you mentioned, Julissa. You know, Julissa gave 20 years uh, of herself to a career, and then when she decided, no, I'm going to go be with my family, everybody had a, a conspiracy theory about it. Um, and then you're looking at Melissa, and Melissa Margarito, who was the first Latina speaker. You have all these women who have opened gigantic doors for the rest of us, and what we owe to them is to do the same thing for the people who are coming behind us, and to pull them up. And I don't mean just for public office. I mean, for there's a lot of other jobs within what we get to do that we could be supporting them, because it isn't just about um, the representation in office. You just mentioned you are the only Latina-owned firm. You have the, your other firm. Why is that? Why don't we have more, more Latinas owning firms? Why don't we have more Latinas at different levels of government? Why don't we have more Latina? Uh, and I'm gonna give uh, Emily a, a, a shout out. Emily was uh, the late Senator Peralta's chief of staff uh, at a time when we did not have many Latina chief of staffs. And so for me, it's like we gotta pull our Latinas and our Latino brothers from different places to make sure that there is representation at all levels. And, um, think about the fact that we don't have many reporters who are Latinos covering these issues. And so when you don't have a reporter who is thinking about politics, community development, and other issues from the angle of coming from a Latino community, we're not gonna get the same coverage. We're not gonna get the same kudos and the same understanding about what's happening. And so all of that is connected. There's, there's this, this, this symbiotic relationship between everything that's happening to get us to be here, to get more of us to be here. Thank you. 
Thank you. And I would like to start by seconding everything that our assemblywoman said. Uh, the, I think the Hispanic community has made a lot of progress, uh, but we still have a lot of work to do, work that is going to take many years, and I, in my opinion, I think many decades and generations. Um, and I think all of us have a duty to continue to open doors for future generations. That is the duty of all of us. Um, and again, the perfect example is the example that I talked about earlier. Um, and it is only an example, the, the fire department. Only 13% of firefighters are Hispanic in a city where, you know, a, there's a really large Hispanic population. And I think there's reason to uh, believe. I think we're going to make a lot of progress. Uh, in the city council, we introduced a bill specifically related to that agency uh, so that they could first um, start recruiting um, in Hispanic communities, but also start training Hispanic communities to um, become firefighters and, and join that field. Um, and that's only an example. We have a lot of work to do in other agencies and in other fields. For example, perfect example or even a much better example is Hollywood. You know, people in Hollywood, you would see them saying, hey, we love diversity. Uh, we love the Hispanic community. We're only great because of the Hispanic community. But then we're invisible in their movies and in their films. So I think and we... They pick a white person to play a Latino. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And equally worse, if we are lucky to make it to their movies, they give us the worst scenes. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, I think we need to grab agency by agency, field by field, and you know, just start holding people accountable, looking at the numbers and telling them, hey, we, we love the speeches, we love how, how much love you show us when you're in front of a podium, but we want you to show the same love in, in when it comes to practice, right? Making sure that Hispanic communities are being hired, but also hired at every level, not only the, low, the lower positions, at every single level. So I think there's a lot of work to do. We need to go agency by agency, field by field, and I think it's gonna take a long time, but I think we're, we're gonna get it done with hard work. Um, in Puerto Rico, we have this saying that el que madruga, Dios lo ayuda. So basically, if you wake up, I, I think it was an excuse my parents used to get me out of bed, but nevertheless, um, basically translated, those who wake up early, God will help you. And I think when about your question, whether it's up to us, half of it is up to us, right? Half of us is up to wake up demand representation, demand that our voices will be heard, even though we might just be called whatever, like a Latina with an attitude, but we have to do the wake up and we have to be there, we have to be present, we have to jump, and even though we are afraid of taking the next step to make sure that we are on the table, and I come from, like I said, government and, and different than the political realm, but many times I have to think take out of my head that idea that in order for me to move to the next level, I had to know 150%. Um, and I had to say, okay, I don't know it all, but I'm going to learn it all. And I know what I know. Um, and so we have to make sure that we are in this space to take advantage of what our politicians are advocating for, right? Because if I'm not, you know, what, if their work would be useless if they're not, if they're going out there and saying we need more Latino representation, but if us in administration and management and, and advocacy, we're not ready to take those positions or we're afraid, then our work, we're just going to be spinning our wheel all the time. So. I, you know, I always, when people come behind me, I always try to encourage people to go into management. And I always encourage people, go and make the money and then just go the nonprofit work. Uh, because money gives you power. In a place like New York City, is no doubt. Um, I think in fundraising, I see it, how my colleagues in Manhattan, which, by the way, if you haven't noticed, all the large bids in New York City are led by people that white, let's just be honest, right? And it is those minorities, we are the ones leading their um, bids in community of colors, an underserved community. We are underpay. And we, I mean, I have Lisa here who comes from the same field and it is a struggle. And we need, you know, someone to raise the voice for to about the unfairness of the lack of representation, but then we need people like me and Lisa and other of my colleagues to say, you know what, that is a big position, but I'm gonna take it. So it, I would say we have to be a partnership. We have to just not only develop the advocates and the elected officials, but we also have to make sure that our kids are getting those MBAs and all those large degrees, um, because otherwise we're gonna be in the same place for a long time.
Thank you for that. Um, so one of the things that I know I talk to a lot of my friends about is the fact that um, I'm Puerto Rican from Williamsburg, born and raised, still live there. Um, but the fact that, you know, Latino doesn't just mean Puerto Rican and Dominican, right? And we spend a lot of time thinking that that's true. Um, one of the beauties, I think, of the Latino community is how diverse we are. Um, how much do you think that stands in the way of progress? I think this goes back to what I was saying about folks thinking there's not a stage that's big enough for for the rest of us. Um, and, and I'm going to actually uh, take us back. I know some folks were in an, uh, on, uh, on the conversation we had uh, earlier this week with city and state and the Latinos and something that Commissioner uh, Lorraine Cortez said. She said, we spend a lot of time thinking about how proud we are to be the first one. And Think about being the first one of five, or the first one of six. And so, yes, it's great. I get to say I wasn't the first Colombian born elected in the state of New York. But what does that mean if I am doing absolutely nothing to kind of help pull other people? And recognizing that as a Colombiana, I didn't get here by myself. And I, and, and I hate to say this, but I love my Colombian people. It wasn't them who helped me get here. It was my Dominican former boss, bosses, many of them. Um, it was uh, my South Asian community. And so I think it's about kind of the, we create, we talk, often talk about borders, but we're creating these own borders for ourselves and the work that we do that often limit how far we can go. Yes, the idea of representation and pushing forward the first of something is fantastic and it gives a sense of pride and of, of like of this nationalist pride and it's wonderful, but we have to recognize that we can't do it by ourselves and that our uh, Puerto Rican and Dominican brothers and sisters have walk that very treacherous political path, or even in the business world. Um, and, and I do want to give a shout out to Leslie. She does, she does our bid. Uh, so I, oh, she's, um, in, 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 to credit to her, it is a headache and a half on some days. And so I, I do got to give her a shout out because she does a fantastic job. But going back to what I was saying earlier, you know, we, because we come from other countries and we come here, we often bring these, these views of one of the politics of how we was back home, which <laughs> depending on which country you come from, it could be a really hot mess. Uh, but then we get here and we get so embedded in, es que yo tengo que ser el primero, o yo tengo que ser la primera. And, 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 I, and as I said before, yes, it is a great sense of pride, but that's not, once you're here, toditos somos iguales. They're going to discriminate against all of us the same. They're going to take us to the back of the room and not let us speak the same. And so if we kind of switch that a little bit and start thinking more about globally how we as Latinos can push all of us together to, to the front of the room, why can't we all just go to the front of the room together and, and create that change for the community that, that we so desperately need um, and, 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 and spend our energies on that? I think, you know, it would be a much better use of, of, of our efforts in making sure that it's the entire Latino community that's sitting in the front of the room. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the Hispanic community has made a lot of progress and we have made that progress and we are here today where we're at uh, because of the work of previous generations. And I'm the first Dominican to represent the 15th council district and I got here not only because of the work of the Dominican population, but because of the work and the contributions and the sacrifice of the entire Hispanic community in the city of New York. And that is the way that we got to look at it. A win for whether it's a Hispanic for the Dominican community, a Colombian community, Mexican community, that is a win for all of us. And at the end of the day, many, we share the same challenges. You know, when you're applying to a job and you have a Hispanic last name, they're going to look at you or they're gonna think and they're gonna make assumptions about whether you are qualified and how you will perform. They're, they're not gonna be looking into whether, oh, is this a person who's Dominican, Puerto Rican, Mexican. They see a Hispanic last name and they're gonna be making assumptions. And the same is true for when you walk into a room making assumptions based on the way that you look, based on the way that you speak, 
based on the way that you dress, based on uh, the neighborhood that you come from. At the end of the day, we share challenges, and they are all related uh, to challenges of the Hispanic community. So I think that is the way we need to see it. We need to start thinking about uh, a, a win for any Hispanic is a win for all of us, whether it is becoming the, the first commissioner of an agency or the first person running or owning a nonprofit. We need to start thinking about, you know, the entire community as a whole, we are one and we, we face uh, the same challenges. And at the end of the day, whether it's a person of Dominican descent, Puerto Rican, or Colombian or Mexican, when they open doors, they're opening doors for all of us, and that is the way we need to see it. You know, I have always had this attitude that when I'm among my people, and I mean Latinos, I'm Puerto Rican, uh, but I present myself to the world and to anyone outside of our community as Latina. Um, and that, that came to value to me when I first stepped into graduate school. I actually was like the only Puerto Rican, or I think there was someone half Puerto Rican, so one and a half. Um, but we, we came from all over the country. We went to Syracuse. Our, our program locally was ranked pretty high. And then we entered that room. We realized that we were all minorities within minorities and that we needed to have our bags. So it was us, the Puerto Ricans and the Mexican predominantly, um, that we have to support each other. And I have to say also the African-American community. I would not be here today, have not been for all those mentors that I have from graduate school. When I first moved to New York, after I was born, came back, which um, the, I only knew one person. It was a graduate from my um, school uh, that it was an African-American male and he took me out to lunch and he's the one who opened doors for me. So. I see myself as a minority, I see myself as a Latina, when we're all together, I was like, God, I love my food, I love my music, I'm very Puerto Rican, what do you want, Where, when are you going to visit my country? But we have to have that unity, right? We need to understand who our allies are and how our communities have helped. I just got back from a conference in, um, for the International Downtown Association. Once again, we were the minorities within the room and all the Latinos and the African Americans, we came together. And we need to understand that it's not only us, but it is all our allies, um, especially when we send our kids out to other places in graduate school that we are outside of the city environment. Being a minority, it, you really, really feel out of place. And so it, it is, that's why the uniqueness of being from that having that background and that history of being um, other uh, makes a difference to have uh, to become part of a larger community. Nod. So I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us for this. Thank you to our incredible panelists for sharing. Um, and I hope that this was useful and I hope that this um, encourages you to, to really think about representation in this community. Um, in a way that means that you will open your doors, you will extend your arms, you'll do everything you can to make sure that um, everybody under, you know, feels welcome and everybody feels represented. Thank you.